So you're you're right for the picking. So membership, one hundred dollars a year. So thirty cents a day, you can become a member of Thai. Enjoy sixty plus events in the year. Fantastic Indian dinners at most of the events, and and enjoy a, you know a room full of people and, a, and stellar panels. So think about it, because um, our big conference is coming up, and this is the beginning of the year, and you can you have the opportunity to to enjoy and, and benefit from lots of our events. So. We were founded in 1992, so this is our 20th year, right here in the Silicon Valley by a group of folks from the Indus region who came here with nothing but their education and their willingness to work hard, and they became wildly successful beyond their wildest dreams. And they said, you know what, we would like to help other people succeed. So that's what they did. They came together, and they told their stories, and they bring other successful entrepreneurs at the time, and lo and behold, here we are 20 years later in 57 cities, 14 countries, and the sole mission is to foster entrepreneurship. Um, to that degree, we have three stakeholders in the ecosystem. So we have our member community, which many of you are members, or future members after this event. Um, it's $100 to become a member, and so if you're an entrepreneur, you're thinking of becoming an entrepreneur, you are supporting an entrepreneur, everybody is welcome at Thai as a member. Then we have our charter member community. The charter members are really the backbone of the organization. They are, um, it's an invitation only. They are invited to become charter members. And they are highly successful entrepreneurs, uh, or serial entrepreneurs, or C-level corporate executives. And they, we ask of them, the, probably the most important thing that you can ask of somebody, and that's their time and their expertise. And they give it to us very freely. Um, and so I have several charter members in the room. Can you raise your hands for me? Raise your hands really high. Okay, so if, if I were some of you, I'd go find one of these guys and sit next to them and get to know them because I guarantee you they will have lots of pearls of wisdom to share with you. Um, they have great connectivity into the valley and the globe and, and they can truly become a, a great friend or mentor to you. Thank you to the charter members, really the backbone of the organization. You're the ones who put together the programs, our board members, and, and they volunteer their time to do so freely. The third stakeholder is our sponsor community. And these are folks in the VC community, law firms, banks, corporate uh, like IBM and HPs. They come to us as the lifeblood of Thai. So we can't do the programs that we do without the support of the sponsors, the support of the charter members, and of course the membership. That's the three stakeholders. And the fourth stakeholder that I didn't mention comes from all of the three, and th that's our volunteer community. So all of the, the folks, except for my five staff and myself, Everybody else volunteers their time to tie. So everybody for, from the people who are helping us at the door, Dan at the back, Gopal who's putting together the program, the speakers, everybody has volunteered their time to be here today. And so this does not work without the volunteer commitment to tie. And we thank the volunteers for their time and commitment to tie. So as I mentioned, we do about 60 plus programs a year. Last year we did 64 programs in the year with an average attendance of 85 people per event, um, and that includes all of the industry uh, technology verticals, social, mobile, cloud, energy, and life sciences. We have a Thai women's forum, an economic forum, we do networking events. We launched a program last year called My Story, which features successful entrepreneurs um, who've had exits, uh, very recent exits. We just launched Pitch Fest last year as well. Um, we also launched Thai Angels at the end of 2010. And that has become a very successful program for us. We've funded 14 companies to date to about $12.5 million with some select VC funders as well. So if you're interested in Thai Angels or looking for seed funding, I encourage you to visit our website. Um, and you can click there. And all the information is there. You can also apply online. It's very, very easy. The Thai Angels meets on the third Monday of each month. So if you're interested in applying, I encourage you to apply now. It's a rolling basis as far as the application goes. Um, then, of course, we do our flagship conference, TyCon, and I'm guessing that many of you have been to TyCon. Um, it is the world's largest conference for entrepreneurs. This year's TyCon is May 18th and 19th. Last year's TyCon was listed in Worth Magazine as one of the top 10 best conferences for ideas and entrepreneurship, along with TED and World Economic Forum, and we're very, very proud of that fact because you know, to be in that kind of company is amazing, but to be in that kind of company with, you know, five staff and 300 volunteers putting together this conference as a nonprofit organization is really, truly outstanding. So I encourage you all, take a look at the tycon.org website. Registration will open in mid-February. Um, and it, we, uh, for our 20th anniversary year, we're going to have a stellar conference again this year. So 
Um, with that, I'd, I'd like to thank my fantastic talented staff, the board of directors. Um, I don't think any of the board members are in the room this evening. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Gopal, who is the chair for our energy program. And he will go ahead and introduce the, uh, the panel for the evening. So thanks for your attention. and macroeconomics, where we have the government, the political system, we have technology, we have finance, we have VC community, we have users. The ecosystem in any industry cannot be as diverse as the clean tech. And it is our honor today that this distinguished panel, they bring in a very, very diversified experience in all these areas. And we'll have, the, we'll have the benefit of their views. And we'll also have some time, this time I promise you, last time we could not do that. This time I promise you, we want to be reserving a little bit more time for interaction from the audience and ask your very, very difficult questions to this panel. If you ask me what is the success of this panel today, of this discussion today, when you ask question and participate, and this panel, they look at each other and say, hmm. Well, I do not know how to really introduce this panel because they have done a great job. They have done great things with their portfolio companies. So my proposal is, why don't you guys introduce yourself and talk about the portfolio companies. So, good evening. Uh, so, it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, 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 try to share some of our views, and also be with, your, with my colleagues. So, uh, I represent uh, Redpoint Ventures, and uh, it's an early stage uh, venture fund. Uh, actually, we have an early stage as well as an early growth uh, fund, and we invest across a variety of uh, different sectors, except uh, life sciences. Uh, majority of our focus is on uh, more uh, IT infrastructure related uh, sectors and uh, we have been investing in uh, materials, energy, environment, uh, you know, the broad umbrella of what we call clean tech for the last six or seven years and we've taken a very uh, cautious approach in this, in this sector and uh, we'll probably get into some of those later on. Uh, we are, uh, we cover all the different uh, spaces. Uh, lithium-ion batteries, photovoltaics, uh, nuclear energy, uh, smart grid, etc. So, uh, so, anyway, so I'll stop there and uh, we can maybe discuss more as the session progresses. Great, I'd like to add my thanks uh, to Nettie Gobal. Thank you for the uh, invitation to speak in front of this audience. My name is Matt Trevithick. I'm a partner at Venrock. Uh, it's a diversified venture capital firm. It was established originally by the Rockefeller family in the 1930s and then put under professional management in 1969, so it was uh, quite uh, an, an older venture capital firm. Um, the early years really uh, were dominated by information technology investing and life science investing, and they are still our you know, largest practices. I was invited to join the firm in 2004 to begin building out an energy investing franchise, and now that's about 15% of our activity. Um, I'm an electrical engineer by training, and so the investments that I tend to focus on are technologies that touch the electrical grid. I also am an automobile enthusiast, so I focus on vehicle technology as well. I have colleagues who are chemists by training, and they focus on anything that starts out as a plant and ends up as a chemical or fuel. And I think the two uh, hemispheres are quite uh, separate, and so our portfolio actually 
with about 10 active companies, spans that region. Good evening. Thank you to Ty for having me. Happy 2012 to you all. I'm John Robinson with NGEN Partners. Uh, we're a clean tech focused venture firm, offices in Palo Alto, Santa Barbara, and New York. Uh, clean tech, of course, is a fairly all encompassing term, which we'll probably dive more deeply into uh, this evening. It's an area that's uh, probably more recently become called clean tech, I would say, in the last eight or so years. Um, I took an interest in the space late 80s, back on a little small town in Long Island, when the, I guess you could call it, green light bulb went off for me, where the nexus of economic and environmental benefits became clear when a, a, there were plans to build a 1,000 ton per day mass burn incinerator right next to our town. There was already one 200, pun, 200 tons per day, and, and rather than spend $90 million doing that, the 1,000 ton per day, they, uh, a full-scale recycling plan was developed for 40, uh, what did it cost, $45 million to, to implement. So it was ultimately more economically beneficial as what led to the adoption of that plan. And so, um, you know, our firm invests across the clean tech space and, and uh, a number of the industry sectors that I've already mentioned, I've been more focused on what's become uh, more known as smart building and, and green IT within the last few years. And certainly look forward to speaking with you all this evening. Thank you. Um, my name is Robert Walker. I'm a partner with Sierra Ventures. Uh, Sierra has been in the Valley for about 28 years. Uh, so a fairly well established firm. We manage a total of about one and a half billion US. Uh, we invest, in, like some of the other firms here, fairly broadly. About 75% of what we invest in goes into kind of traditional IT, software, SaaS, uh, digital media, things like that. Um, we don't have a specific clean tech practice. I, uh, about 25% of what we do, we give the sexy title hardware. Um, and it's kind of an old term, but I'm one of the hardware guys. Uh, and we, look, we invest in stuff, which is somewhat out of fashion today compared to a few years ago, but we still believe in it. Probably about 60 to 70% of what I look at, you could put into a clean tech category, whether it's battery technology, energy efficiency, solid state lighting, different materials technologies, things like that. Some of it falls into less traditional, you know, more traditional hardware and materials and sorts of things that don't have a clean tech spin. Uh, we do invest globally. Since I'm at a Thai event, I need to say we do. We invest uh, strategically directly into both India and China, and we now have three investments in Europe. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the Indian domestic travel market, we were the only U.S. investor in Make My Trip, which went public last year, so that was a nice a nice uh, investment for us. I just needed to kind of take advantage of that. <laughs> um, but, uh, and we do it all from a single office here in, uh, in Silicon Valley and Sand Hill Road. So we're all entrepreneurs by background. We don't mind traveling uh, to board meetings and things like that. Uh, and some of these guys know me from uh, my background is out of LEDs and solid state lighting. For those of you that have heard of Bridgelux before I joined Sierra, I was CEO of Bridgelux, but 18 year veteran of LEDs and solid state lighting. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Scheinbein, and um, thanks for having me. It's my first time here, although I've heard a lot of golf tie from my partners and colleagues. Um, so I work at CMEA Capital, where uh, traditional life science, IT, and energy and materials. In the energy and materials practice, um, I think we have about 10 or 12 active companies in this space at this time. Um, my focus, I would say, is anything non-biology, although we have a chemical engineering um, background and, and a lot of those turn into uh, chemical processing, but um, most of my focus has been um, more um, away from the bio side. And I um, originally started my career in wastewater, but a lot spent a lot of time in um, supply chain operations, manufacturing, and so we have been thinking a lot about scaling um, and, and how we how we do that, what makes what makes a lot of sense for venture, and um, putting a lot of thought into, into that and how that overlaps with this energy um, sector. Thank you. Well, give them a big hand, please. Now I know one thing for sure. Next time any of you has any problem for domestic travel in India, <laughs> we all go there for vacation. If you have any problem, please call Bob Walker, Zero Ventures, and he will solve all your problems. He will. <laughs> all right. Before we begin our event today, I really would like to request all of you, this is going to be an exciting next 30, 60 to 70, 80 minutes. This is the last call for your water, wine, chai, coffee, anything that you guys want to get. And if you have not gotten got it done, 
you missed it. Uh, this is our first event in 2012, and I think it will be a good idea for us to really look at where were we in 2011 and get the perspective from our panelists. But I think before we talk about uh, talk to our panelists, I really would like to get your views. So the way I looked at it, since 1900, the world population has become four times. And the real income has grown by 25 times. And the consumption has grown, the consumption of energy has grown up by 22 to 23 percent, 23 times. It is absolutely a huge problem. And while we're talking about energy, we still have a billion people on this world, on this earth, who do not have access to clean water. Given all these problems, VCs, government, and the corporate, they all have an investing money. VCs have not yet made any money in clean tech. Uh, some of you might have, but I don't think it by and large, as a community, VCs have not made any money. And the government money has not been very effectively used. We have a surrender story over here on the left-hand side. We just have made a huge amount of money on things like Groupon that has taken off. So really let's talk about whether the clean tech industry, is it really dead or it is down? I have my views, but before we get their views, please raise your hands who think that this industry is really dead. <laughs> wow. Great answer. Self-selected. <laughs> Self-selected group. So I would really like to start with Nidhi and talk about in 2011, please give us your perspective about your the industry, the market, your portfolio companies, how did they perform, and what do you expect, what do you expected, and what you get, and what you didn't get. So I think uh, 2011 was a difficult year for uh, the sector uh, for a variety of reasons, and uh, some of them are that other sectors that uh, VC money can go into were doing extremely well. Uh, they were very, very active, there were a lot of potential exits, and there was a lot of uh, pull from the people downstream that would either acquire them or that would be potential entities. And so there is that uh, one uh, aspect. Uh, the other is uh, uh, a lot of things that people expected uh, to make uh, these energy-related technologies become uh, viable businesses or going concerns really did get the uh, necessary support from the different players in the ecosystem, whether it's a government uh, policy, regulation, or uh, companies downstream. Uh, remember that uh, when you create something in the IT world or uh, digital media, etc., it's a green field, right? If something, uh, uh, so it's got that uh, uh, pull. Uh, also, if something goes wrong, a few bits are wrong, nothing happens. But on the other side, if you're messing with electricity and uh, water or some of these other things that are considered uh, rights, and you absolutely cannot live without them, there's a separate, different level of uh, uh, requirement or uh, uh, emphasis put on those. And you're dealing with you know industries that are many, many decades old, some hundred years old. So I think uh, the ecosystem has not developed evenly so that it created a pull for many of these. As a result, uh, you know many companies that needed follow-on financings didn't get the necessary funding, and uh, so there are a lot of uh, companies that need the next round, whether it's a rebound or a seed round or later round, and uh, they're looking for that uh, funding. So that's created a logjam, and uh, we have to work ourselves way through that in order to get the uh, thing freed up. So, you know, I don't think it is dead by any means, because all the fundamental uh, requirements and opportunities still exist, and. Uh, Yeah, I think the reason many of us are here, it's the only reason I'm here, is because I believe there's an equation that drives the world. And the amount of energy that is required by this world is basically equal to the number of people on it, the amount of stuff per person, and the amount of energy per unit of stuff. Now, let's go through each of those terms. You've already said the population is increasing, that's just a fact. Um, the second term is a really interesting one I find aspirational. We actually want people globally to increase their standards of living. So we want them to have, we want there to be more stuff per person. That's a good thing. And the last one is actually an energy efficiency term. 
the energy content per unit stuff. And so what's interesting to me are there's an opportunity to produce better technology into the energy market to let people attain a higher standard of living. And there's an, there's an efficiency term, so to use less energy doing it. So I believe that the tailwinds for this sector are very strong at our backs and continue to be at our backs, despite some of the hiccups that, uh, that Gopal mentioned. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is uh, we've done some analysis here of the successful clean tech companies, and there have been, I think, 23, uh, if success is defined by having gone public on a major U.S. exchange. Uh, and these were 23 companies, venture backs, that were started since 2000. Uh, the average time to go public, and these are the winners, was nine years. So that means the average time is going to be nine or ten years. So two things. I think entrepreneurs in clean tech have to have extraordinary patience. This is a ten-year journey just to get started. Uh, and I think there's a lot of the challenges associated with that, and Nettie touched on some of the finer details. How do you get a financing plan that gets you all the way there? How do you uh, have a hiring plan? You know, maybe the notion of four-year option packages is obsolete. That's something from the IT space. So my view is Silicon Valley on mass has been investing in energy, you know, five or six, seven years by some accounts. We may just be halfway there. So to really give up the ghost now seems really short-sighted. Thank you, Ryan. The optimistic view of last year, at least for me, and I think for a lot of my colleagues, is it, it we almost it, like a sea kind of crystallized what really made sense for venture and what didn't. I think before this, we spent a lot of time, our, our people were kind of rushing in, just huge market, huge opportunity, but not thinking what's the subset that really fits into venture, how does venture make money, and then what was in energy fits into that. And so in addition to last year spending a lot of time, and I think Eddie said earlier, of all, all I think um, 80 or 90 percent of our company's fundraise um, last year, which is a lot of time from a venture and um, the people involved that were already in investment with introductions and you know, a lot of times it would come through strategics and different, um, different non-traditional um, financing paths. Um, so in addition to that, I think the other thing that really happened last year as an industry is just a lot of more clarity of what makes sense going forward. And that might mean that, you know, the negative is that the subset is probably smaller. So for new people entering, that can be, you know, a little bit more challenging. On the other hand, there's a lot of clarity about what makes sense and what can get done and what can be successful and what your real constraints are going to be. And that's really helpful in going now because I think you know, you have the euphoria, you come down from it, and now is a really time where you start to realize, yeah, we're part of industrials. What kind of um, valuation should we really have? Yes, if we are, if we do need to scale, or what kind of companies can we scale in venture dollars? What kind of partners do we need to do that? So a lot of things really became clear as we went through um, some of the, the challenges in last year. But that's a very good point. Uh, I think I'll come back to uh, talking, discussing more about this point, Rachel. Let's go to uh, Bob. What do you have to say about 2011 and your portfolio companies uh, in 2011? Well, one of the big lessons, there's a macro trend, which Mary will talk about a little bit later, but one of the big lessons that we've had is because we live in Silicon Valley, because we have an entrepreneurial venture background and kind of used to the whole infrastructure here, we're used to dealing with companies that are powered by Moore's Law that sell in an entrepreneurial environment. If you think of the giants of the IT industry, companies like Intel and Google and even Microsoft, these are companies that still have an entrepreneurial core. They're still, even companies like Samsung and LG in the consumer electronics space. It, you, you got to come up with the next cell phone. You got to come up with the next display technology. You got to, you know, you look at what's going on with OLEDs and display technology. These are industries where if you miss a product cycle or two, you are dead. And so, you know, Google's scared of Facebook. Microsoft's scared of Google. Facebook's, you know, scared of, you know, Twitter, you know, and all this stuff, right? They, you live in constant fear of, of missing the next wave. And you can be Microsoft and on top of the world, the world in 2000 and 2010. You know, Microsoft, right? I mean, you know, it's kind of becoming almost, you know, a, a, the past. Um, and a lot of the industries, the clean tech, in, the, that we consider clean tech industries, don't operate that way at all. You look at water, <coughs> um, municipal water. Thing. No guy working in a municipal water plant is going to lose his job because he doesn't buy the latest, greatest technology. <coughs> These are people that have one goal in life, and that's to retire and get their pension and not make a mistake that gets them fired between now and then. 
So if there's a new technology, let somebody else buy it. Let's wait five years. Maybe we'll buy it then. Um, so I, I think for venture dollars to work effectively, we have to pick industries where startup companies can come in with new technologies and new techniques and get adopted in some realistic time scale where, that VCs can operate in. And, you know, nine years is kind of on the edge, right? We have funds that are, have 10 year lifetimes. So I think you have to kind of pick those areas where, whether it's not selling in the, the, a business plan that's focused on the US, but it's focused on India or China or other markets where there might be a more pressing need. Um, or focused on in those industry sectors where people will adopt and get new technologies. Or find having a business plan that depends on partnering with established industry partner, players. So you're not trying to directly sell a new product with an, an, a no-name company, but working in partnership with an established brand that will get it out there. I think it has to be more sophisticated thinking about how we sell products and how we market and generate revenue in a meaningful time scale. John, what do you have to say on the same topic? Yeah, I, I would, I think it's important to also think about how we define or draw a circle or a box or whatever you want around what clean tech is, as we were debating earlier. It's a fairly broad-based term. And so, you know, are there companies that are explicitly, clearly, clean tech companies, solar companies that we have investments in like Solar or Soul Focus, or are there companies that are more inherently more resource efficient where their their value proposition is driving cost savings, like a company like Mocha 5, that they have a distributed desktop virtualization solution. Ultimately it's it's its value prop is driving down the cost of managing desktops and laptops and making it easier for IT groups with a single image. But they can do it in a much more resource efficient approach that they can get to five thousand users on one server versus competing solutions in the marketplace from very well-established companies that are supporting, you know, um, 50 users a server. And so it's not explicitly a clean tech company, but it's, it's, it's driving resource efficiency. I mean, we started a debate, and I think there's various points of view here on the panel, is whether even a company like a VMware is a clean tech company. You know, is that company clean tech where they're taking servers and, and ultimately virtualizing them and getting more work per watt. You know, that's that's debatable as to whether or not that's ultimately clean tech. So I think, you know, we need to, uh, all of us as, as um, investors, as, as, um, as also as entrepreneurs and even as customers, thinking about what is, you know, clean tech. Is WebEx clean tech? Well, less people have to travel, you know? So, I mean, that's, and that's, that's a good point stuff that we've been thinking about. That's a very good point, and I think uh, from this, uh, kickoff question, the, the two things that I understood, the common thread in what you guys are talking about is about the VC model, the how VCs are investing and how VCs are going to be investing, how VCs are investing, how they're going to be investing, the VC model, which was driven from the hype of uh, the internet or 2000, and the returns based on that, and the returns on the Groupons and not versus on the returns on Solyndra. So it's a VC model. And the second uh, common topic I, I realized over here, common thread is, what is clean tech? And are we really setting right expectations and defining clean tech and the return on that? So we will discuss both these questions together in more in detail. Let me first start, uh, Bob, with you. Uh, Rachel and Bob, you both talk about the VC model. And, uh, and uh, Matthew talked about the entitlement and uh, the 10 years time for the Again, that reflects back on the VCs, are they really willing to wait for 10 years and get into those kind of investments versus a two years or three years expectations of making uh, three to four times of money. So I think there is, there is an entitlement, as Matt was talking about, is going up. We are spending more and more energy, and the VC model is breaking. Let me start with Bob. Well, what do you think about the VC model that it was and what it is going to be? And what are the opportunities for 2012? Well, there's there's one major macro trend, or a couple major macro trends that I think impacts quote the clean tech community. By the way, I think clean tech is not a sector. I think clean tech is a complete misnomer. We hate the term clean tech. Clean tech is a theme. It's just simply a theme about energy and water and populated. But it's only a theme. It's not a sector. It's not a market. And there are. No clean tech companies in my mind. There's energy companies, there's water companies, there's energy efficiency companies, there's IT companies. 
but that's that's part of the debate. I'm sure we'll have. Um, but to get to the theme about what how that how clean tech companies are being impacted, one is we have to recognize that the venture industry, particularly in the U.S., um, is in somewhat of a decline. It had this these bubble years of '99 or 2000. It got too big, and it's had a decade of relatively flat returns, which is not our business model. And until the resources become smaller and it shrinks some more because of these 10-year uh, life cycles, we're not probably going to get back into the positive return category, which is what gets our LPs to give us money. So you have this macro trend of a, of a shrinking venture industry, um, coupled with less money coming in, less money being raised, less money going into new funds, and that means there's less money for the entrepreneurs to access. Secondly, the Groupons and the Facebooks and the LinkedIn's and all the stuff going on with cloud computing and Amazon Web Services and, and this, these incredibly capital efficient companies that with a very small amount of capital can have, a, at least you see enough cards pretty quickly to figure out whether they're going to be a big hit or not. That's who your competitors are if you're trying to raise venture money from us. You know, I've got to sit there and say, I've got this company that's a biofuel company and it's going to take eight years and $150 million and build a factory. Or there's these three kids with some idea about a dating site or how to connect with people in bars or something. And they need 500K and if it works, you know, they're going to, it's going to be worth $100 million. Right? And that's, we have to decide which, which one is going to make us the best return. And even for those of us that kind of are pushing more of the hardware, clean tech kind of deals, um, we have to compete with our partners for the resources and the funds. And so that, that is certainly an issue. I believe that because the industry has pulled so back, so far back from some of these things, we're going to see a capital constrained industry where the people that still do these kinds of investments are going to get big ownership percentages, low valuations, get the pick of the crop, and you're going to see a lot of successes in the sector. And then you'll uh, see everybody saying, my god, why did I invest in Groupon number 624 in China? You know, and, uh, you know, the other lemmings are going to go back this way again. So um, your answer is you'll be looking for some clean dating websites. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, I got it. So, Daddy, what do you have to think about? Give me some examples in uh, if you're looking in for a fast return from the VC community, VC funding perspective in the clean tech team. What could be kind of examples where the entrepreneurs could, and VCs together could think both ways? Okay. So I think uh, the, um, there are two ways to think about it. Uh, one, which is the entrepreneurial way, is to say, what is close to being deployed? And where is there a pull for the products you're making? And uh, if you look at all the big uh, uh, existing industries uh, who have figured out that uh, using energy efficient uh, mechanisms or products is really in their interest because if, of its economic value, you are seeing a lot of pull. So bio-based chemicals, as an example, right? They are hedging or uh, fighting against the rising price of petrochemical uh, feedstocks. And first is they want diversification of their feedstocks because they don't want to have an unpredictable price that they can't uh, deal with. And second, they don't want a high price. So you see a lot of companies that are going, that know that at least a portion of their uh, product set has to be from a feedstock that they know is predictable, they have better control over, and they can uh, manage it better. Uh, the other is uh, potentially solid state lighting. Uh, you see a lot of uh, value being generated uh, beyond, I mean, just from the use case itself. Right? So you'll see those things. Uh, you look at uh, people who manage waste, uh, and waste management has an enormous uh, uh, effort in figuring out how to make their uh, trucks and vehicles run on uh, things that can be lower cost, better efficiency, and carry that over to their products. What do they do with the landfills and things like that? So, so that's <coughs> one part, right? That's the more uh, typical approach of saying, okay, I want to change my I want to look at businesses where the deployment is going to happen and there is a pull because of the economic value, not the green value or not driven by tax credits or uh, incentives or rebates because those can be a sweetener, but they cannot make the business. Right? That's one. The other is to take uh, companies and uh, dress them up as IT or software players so that people understand 
uh, both on the funding side as well as the buying side, that hey, this is the happening thing. You know, this is uh, software or this is a new business model, whether it's SaaS or PaaS or whatever it is, and you fit into that model. And uh, there are many examples like you know building energy efficiency or various ways of uh, dealing with that, uh, green ITs and stuff. So anyway, I'll stop there and. Uh, uh, Eddie, uh, I, want to, I don't want to stop there, but I want uh, you to be telling the audience about the 2012 predictions. Okay. And what, if you have to invest, what, 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 what would you all be investing? I think 2012 predictions more. So, uh, you know, I think uh, it is the uh, companies that have, that are much closer to deployment. If people come with a fantastic uh, idea that is at a late science stage or about to get out of a lab, and that needs several years of development and has unknown funding profile in the future, I think that will be difficult. Or at least the number of people who would be willing to do those kinds of deals is going to be difficult, which means that for us that might want to support it, we'll have to think very hard because who is our partner? Because you cannot do it with A round alone. You need the B round, you need the C round. So who's going to fund it? So I think that's a challenge. And uh, unless that, uh, log jam or the pipeline gets cleared or you have clarity on how that goes forward, you know, people will be looking for more uh, later stage, uh, just either in deployment, pre-deployment, or who have phenomenal connection with a strategic that is going to help them <coughs> to take them to market. Perfect. Matt, what do you think about the 2012 predictions? <coughs> so many topics that were raised by this uh, panel. Um, so let me just jump into 2012. What VCs might invest in? I think the, the answer for me personally is gross margin. Uh, I think what a lot of uh, clean tech entrepreneurs have forgotten, uh, at least when they're not from the doors of venture capital firm, is that most of the money that uh, has been made in venture capital tech companies have been in products that have 50 to 60 to 70 percent margin. On the IT side, we were driven by Moore's Law, which created an unnaturally rapid replacement cycle. There's such a need, as Bob articulated, down the laser way this thing we're willing to get paid. Uh, customers are willing to pay for, for that value. Uh, on the healthcare side, it's, it's very similar. It's a lot of investment to invent a new drug, for example, but actually making that drug uh, you know, yields very, very high margins. The challenge in clean tech is that uh, you're shipping hardware, and it's an industrial category, as, as Rachel mentioned, uh, building material most directly. And so, how do you get beyond the 20 to 30 percent? gross margin business is hard. Now, a 20 to 30% gross margin business does not have very high multiples on sales or earnings. And so basically those types of businesses have to earn every dollar of valuation they get by getting top line revenue and they need flawless execution to make sure that those thin gross margins actually yield a positive net margin at the end of the day. So if you get it wrong, you find yourselves just hemorrhaging money. So I personally, uh, unless actually uh, any of this. I'm less concerned about the stage of the business, but just if, if you win the prize, uh, is it a prize worth winning in the sense that you build a value? So for me, that's what's winning. Rachel, what do you think will be 2012? What would you see in the industry? Would you see? I want to touch a little bit more about the consolidation of the existing investments and uh, the the cover, the corporate fundings and things like that. What do you see are the, what do you, what do you in predictions for 2012 from investment perspective at a macro level? Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll speak specifically to those um, points about one, strategics. Um, I think I have seen no shortage, in fact, I think increased interest from strategics in the sector, which is interesting because we started this panel saying, is, is this dead, is this an area of not of interest? But then we're seeing a lot of companies from, I would say, across very different sectors and industries that are um, interested in making, um, building relationships with venture firms um, and their, their portfolio companies. And my guess is you'll continue to see them come in. Um, everyone from, like, I've talked to last year, uh, General Mills to Delta Electronics, to you know, all the large chemical um, companies, you know, really consumer products. It's just all over the map of who's interested in coming in, and I and I, I think that will continue as um, these companies have money on their balance sheet and are um, interested in, in 
seat getting into the space and have very different timelines uh, than, than the venture community has. So that for sure, I think um, we'll continue to see, see more partnerships on that. And they're actually successful. I think in some other sectors you say, oh, I don't want a big bureaucratic group connected with me. But in this sector, it's actually very useful for either technology adoption, um, scale, or market adoption. Um, so that that's one trend that I think will we'll continue into this year. I think people will, I think also this year, um, I think there will be a shakeout of companies that it's, you know, I think back to, to Matt's point, it's either, you know, most of us, either you get down the cost curve or you're not. <coughs> and so if you're not going to be at where the, where the cost targets are getting to today, just give up. And also why, as, why would our community continue to put money into companies that just are fundamentally not going to get there? I think there will be some failures, but the ones, the optimism that I saw last year, the companies that did raise, they spent so much time thinking through a lot of these issues that I'm actually seeing a lot of huge ramps, and maybe it's just where we are in our portfolio and where we invested, but this year was a huge year for a lot. I'm talking, you know, 10x in, in revenue, kind of, you know, getting to EBITDA positive for multiple um, companies in my, that I'm on the board of, so it's, it's going to be a big year for the companies that, that do have momentum, do have the funding, and, um, and have the cost um, or whatever their differentiation, but it's most usually cost in the sector figured out. Um, I, I guess so. Joe, what do you think about it? Well, it's exciting in terms of your portfolio. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> Want to tell us more? <laughs> uh, in terms of, uh, this is super loud, this one. Can I switch this? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, in terms of opportunities, within clean tech in 2012, um, thinking more broadly, I mean, in an area we've looked at quite a bit, and I'm sure a number of the members of the panel have, is you know, green building, smart building, lighting solutions, obviously, more hardware oriented, as well as software solutions that can drive greater energy efficiency across a building or an enterprise. But some of the challenges within those uh, sectors or verticals, whatever you want to call them, is, is the rate of adoption. and I think what you're going to start to see are and companies like Opower that have announced partnerships with the likes of Facebook, where you're going to see the integration of across sectors where there's interest from VCs in terms of all right, energy efficiency and social media and social marketplaces where you know I've heard utilities talk about how on the residential front, the driver for the adoption of greater energy efficient technologies and practices isn't the fact that it appeals to people's green wallet that they think they're going to save some money. It's actually their green ego. It's, oh, my neighbor is, you know, is, is doing better by the environment than me. And so how do you leverage those incentives? I mean, that's some of the, the type of stuff that perhaps, you know, hopefully we'll see more opportunities in. Um, another area where certainly, you know, we've seen a lot of volatility in terms of prices and, and cause for even, you know, um, unrest around the world is, is you know, the area of food and food supply and pricing and, and are there going to be more opportunities? I mean, there's some, there's some developments in the whole ag tech area and some companies that are driving, you know, solutions that leverage software and hardware and optimizing, you know, water use and crops right here in the Central Valley. Those types of solutions. Obviously, there's things that can, you know, obviously cross into the whole biotech space and um, a number of different things. So I think you'll see more perhaps in the, in the ag tech area. You know, I mean, the reality is, I mean, you mentioned Solyndra. I mean, an important thing to note is just that, and the fact is, is that, as I understand, I mean, the, the solar space in the U.S. is a, is a net exporter and a job creator, and, you know, Solyndra is just one unfortunate um, you know, situation in, in a, overall, I think, a, a fairly positive story that maybe this sector has gone through some bumps. But as so that's true, here, but, uh, you know, there's, yeah. a good, there's a good point yeah. made on the... Um, the, co the combination of technologies like Facebook or the energy, I am still finding it difficult. Maybe I'm too old to think it that way, but I do not know how younger generation like Sharon, who is sitting in over here, who is on the Facebook and talking, his friends talking about energy consumption and the PG&E bill. I think that that talks about PG&E bill, and not him. So I'm, I'm yet to see, maybe this generation, when they grow up, and we're talking back again 10 years, 10 years from now, when these guys are more on Facebook, they may, they may be talking about the clean theme, not the industry, the clean energy theme. 
and uh, those social problems, they become the economic problems. But in the near future, I think Richard's point is done on target is the GN, the gross margin, and the cost curve. And we have seen in the last one year, just 12 months, we had been talking about the solar panels were sold at buck 70, buck 80 per watt. This year, 2012, the solar panels will be 90 cents a watt. I have not seen any cost curve that aggressive as this cost curve. It has beaten up all the 20% price decline model in the semiconductor industry. And I know for sure the industry is working on 60 cents a watt on solar panels. The problem is, either those industries will become the 5% gross margin industries and they will marginalize themselves and become the contract manufacturers and there will be different kind of industries that will come to drive the gross margins and the Wall Street and the VC model. So it is a lot of iteration that might happen and I think with this distinguished panel, they have the best possible access to all the ideas in the vertical segments in the industry and the sub-segments to really solve those problems in a clean tech theme, which is not one industry, to really let's try to filter that out and figure out opportunities for entrepreneurs like you people for, from these guys. Where do you think is exactly what we're talking about? It is not one single technology, it's a huge undefined market space. Where do you guys think will we, we will be able to match the cost curve, the decelerated cost curve, make it affordable for all of us, including everybody worldwide, and the company is still making a 50% gross margin. What do you guys think could be an opportunity from water, the hybrid car, the solar, the wind, the, soft, the green software, or the green IT, or the grid management? What do you guys think could be for the next three years a fair chance to invest, improve lives, and make money. Richard, let's start with you. Okay. Okay, Matt, thanks about this because uh, there's been an awful lot of talk about economics here, and uh, I want to change just that that, uh, that theme for a minute here. Make aspirational products. That's how you earn gross margins. How many people in this room own an iPhone? There are many, many better phones you can buy at a lower price, right? But this is such a delightful product that Apple became the most valued company in technology history as a result of producing delightful products. And I think that uh, pressing the green theme of the consumer is an interesting way to do it. And um, I actually wanted to, uh, to challenge you, Gopal, there about the government's uh, loan guarantee programs not being effective. Tesla received about the same size of loan guarantee as Solyndra did. And you can argue that at a $3 billion company today, Tesla is a success story. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, Elon Musk uh, you know, says it very well. Tesla is now selling s critical drivetrain technology electric vehicles to Mercedes-Benz and Toyota. And you have to go back about 80 years before an American automobile company exported key drivetrain technology to Germany and Japan. So it's an absolutely success case. So, but I wanted to actually get some audience participation here. And I invest in vehicles, so let's kind of make this a little more fun. Um, how many people here would like to drive, actually let me go, how many people here drive a Nissan Leaf? Start with that, okay, one, sorry. How many would like to drive a Nissan Leaf? Okay, so that's really interesting, that's, that's small, it's about maybe, uh, you know, 15%. How many people here would like to drive a plug-in hybrid like a Chevy Volt? Okay, and you have a Volt, that would be my next question. So we have one Volt and one Leaf. Okay, that's that's interesting balance there because, um, uh, you know, and now, now the final question obviously is how many people would like to drive a Tesla Model S when that's made available? Okay, so I think that's what that's the reaction I was looking for, right? So if you make an aspirational product, people with uh, disposable income that have a choice of automobiles to purchase would rather buy that. And sir, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Tesla has been promising S model for last three years. Is it brilliant? You still want one? No, I finally bought both. Yeah, but okay. the end of 2012. Yeah, but you buy one when it comes out, right? So this is, this is an interesting thing, aspirational technology works. I am craving my iPhone 5. I will wait. I was disappointed last, last fall, but I will wait. See, but you can't wait for a car, you know. 
you can't wait for a car. You can wait for a phone, maybe for a 16-inch TV. No, but you'll, buy, you'll buy a new one. When that comes out, well, uh, sir, I bet you in thank two you. years you're going to have a Model S. Would that be a fair bet to take? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I feel good already. <laughs> So, so, no, my point is you can make margin by producing truly great products that, that delight customers. And, uh, and, and the final point in the vehicle space is I've invested in it. It strikes me that um, hybrid vehicles are a bit of a compromise and that, that might be dominated by the likes of Toyota and General Motors. But an all-electric vehicle, that, that, that inspires the imagination. That's, that's something that, uh, you know, is, is aspirational. And I think that's the basis of a disruptive business, Tesla. Great answer. Rachel. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not going to put the bar at that 50% gross margin. It's, it's, I think that's maybe a little bit aggressive. I mean, in the end, if we're if our companies are going to exit through acquisition, they need to be accretive, and they're probably more likely to be accretive through um, you know, EBITDA than they are through revenue at you know, the time it takes to scale. So I'm looking for that being accretive more than a certain percentage uh, gross margin. And one thing, um, and it's, I'm lucky because I get to work with